Most holy God, we confess to you and to each other that we are rarely just in all our ways, and far from being kind in all our doings, what we want to be and what we actually are are two different things. Our lives are a mishmash of astuteness and stupidity, of moral strength and cowardice, of kindness and meanness, of openness and cunning, of sincere love for you, yet also of conniving self-interest. We need both your justice and your kindness to convict us of our sins, to forgive us and cleanse us, and to save us from the power of evil in the days that lie ahead. We need your mercy to wipe away shame and disabling regrets your light to give us our bearings, and your friendship to delight with us in our happiness and to comfort us in our sorrows. Please grant to us, loving God, the grace of a new beginning, the joy of an enlarged love for you. Give us a passion for all your loving ways, through Christ Jesus, our Creator and Redeemer. Now hear these words of assurance. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all, and his compassion is over all that he has made. The Lord is faithful in all his words, and gracious in all his deeds. The Lord upholds all who are falling, and raises up all who are bowed down. Hear the word of the Lord in Jesus. Your sins are forgiven. Thanks be to God. We will now say together the alternative Lord's Prayer, which is printed in your order of service. Our Father, who dwells in the heavens and on the earth, you are holy. May heaven be a greater present reality here on earth. And may we choose to join you in making that happen. Provide us today with the things that you think we need. And may we not take for granted that which you have already provided for us. Forgive us for when we don't live as you intend. And may we be ready to forgive others when they don't live as we intend. Guide us in your wisdom away from the things that would distort us and restore the parts in us that are already distorted. You are goodness, beauty and truth. May your love rule always. Amen. In our readings today we will hear the story, the familiar story of the feeding of the 5,000. But I wanted to share this reflection with you, which just makes us think how it must have been for a young boy on a hillside with food hidden in his backpack. You know that feeling you get, that twisting type of bright yellow in your tongue, and it's kind of cold around it, and you just know, any moment now, it's going to give one almighty gurgling growl. And the juices in your mouth start running, and the thoughts in your head start running on juicy meat and crunchy vegetables, and sweet bread and salt fish and tangy spice, and crusty bread and silky butter and sticky jam. And the salt air blowing up from the shore sharpens your appetite like an axe grinder. And you look at the grass under your feet and, and wonder if it would taste so bad after all. And then you realise you've been listening and laughing and marvelling and wondering full blast since the morning. And now it's tea time. And where did lunch time go? And it's a long way home. Ah, but remember the bag in your back. Fumble in it. Open it. Secretly. As tums rumbling all around. What a beast. Five rolls, a couple of fish, should help fill the gap until you're home again. 
sneak behind a bush to guzzle in secret. But is there any food? Anything at all? However small? Oh, the rolls have little voices calling, eat me, eat me. The fish try to swim up to your open mouth. You sigh and you take a step out and shrug and say, take this mate, take it all. They take you with them to the man who laughs away their rueful exclamations and thanks you and thanks God with full hands and open heart and words that feed your soul and breaks your bread apart and the fish and breaks it apart again again and again and passing it on, giving it out, his hands darting through a shower of crumbs and laughing in delight with the handfuls, armfuls, skirtfuls of bread and fish and his friends rush out to the people, throwing it in great arcs of crumbly, crusty, oily feasting. You are standing in a sea of food. It's up to your neck. They can't pass it out fast enough, and you and the man are laughing at the sight of your heads poking through great heaps of fishy bits and chunks of bread. You gaze at it. Is it real? You touch it, squeeze it, smell it, lick it, nibble it, munch it, gobble it, swallow it, wallow in it, roll in it, swim through it, a whole mountainside of food. You count the leftovers later when every one of 5,000 has gone away stuffed to the brim, 12 full to overflowing. And all this from him and you. And we're going to stand and sing, if you are able, our second hymn, Worship the Lord in the Beauty of Holiness. <laughs>
first reading is from the second chap- uh, book of Samuel, chapter 11, verses 1 to 15. David and Bathsheba. The following spring, at the time of the year when kings usually go to war, David sent out Joab with his officers and the Israelite army. They defeated the Ammonites and besieged the city of Rabbah. But David himself stayed in Jerusalem. One day, late in the afternoon, David got up from his nap and went to the palace roof. As he walked about up there, he saw a woman having a bath. She was very beautiful. So he sent a messenger to find out who she was and learned that she was Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam and the wife of Uriah the Hittite. David sent messengers to fetch her. They brought her to him and he made love to her. She had just finished her monthly ritual of purification. Then she went back home. Afterwards, she discovered that she was pregnant and sent a message to David to tell him. David then sent a message to Joab, Send me Uriah the Hittite. So Joab sent him to David, and when Uriah arrived, David asked him if Joab and the troops were well and how the fighting was going. Then he said to Uriah, Go home and rest a while. Uriah left and David sent a present to his home. But Uriah did not go home. Instead, he slept at the palace gates with the king's guards. When David heard that Uriah had not gone home, he asked him, You've just returned after a long absence. Why didn't you go home? Uriah answered, The men of Israel and Judah are away at the war, and the covenant box is with them. My commander Joab and his officers are camping out in the open. How could I go home, eat and drink, and sleep with my wife? By all that's sacred, I swear that I could never do such a thing. So David said, Then stay here the rest of the day, and tomorrow I'll send you back. So Uriah stayed in Jerusalem that day and the next. David invited him to supper and made him drunk. But again that night Uriah did not go home. Instead he slept on his blanket in the palace garden. The next morning David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by Uriah. He wrote, Put Uriah in the front line where the fighting is heaviest, then retreat and let him be killed. Amen. reading is from John, chapter 6, reading from verse 1 to 21. Jesus feeds a great crowd. After this, Jesus went across Lake Galilee, or Lake Tiberias, as it is also called. A large crowd followed him because they had seen his miracles of healing those who were ill. Jesus went up a hill and sat down with his disciples. The time of the Passover festival was near. Jesus looked round and saw that a large crowd was coming to him. So he asked Philip, where can we buy enough food to feed all these people? He said this to test Philip. Actually, he already knew what he would do. Philip answered, For everyone to have even a little, it would take more than 200 silver coins to buy enough bread. Another of his disciples, Andrew, 
who was Simon Peter's brother, said, There is a boy here who has five loaves of barley bread and two fish. But they will certainly not be enough for all these people. Make the people sit down, Jesus told them. There was a lot of grass there. So all the people sat down. There were about 5,000 men. Jesus took the bread, gave thanks to God, and distributed it to the people who were sitting there. He did the same with the fish. And they all had as much as they wanted. When they were all full, he said to the disciples, Gather the pieces left over. Let us not waste any. So they gathered them all up and filled twelve baskets with the pieces left over from the five barley loaves that the people had eaten. Seeing this miracle that Jesus had performed, the people were said, the people there said, Surely this is the prophet who was to come into the world. Jesus knew that they were about to come and seize him in order to make him king by force. So he went off again to the hills by himself. When evening came, Jesus' disciples went down to the lake and got into a boat and went back across the lake towards Capernaum. Night came on, and Jesus still had not come to them. By then, a strong wind was blowing and stirring up the water. The disciples had rowed about five or six kilometers where they, when they saw Jesus walking on the water, coming near the boat, and they were terrified. Don't be afraid, Jesus told them. It is I. Then they willingly took him into the boat, and immediately the boat reached land at the place they were heading for. Here endeth the lesson.
Then the doctor put a stethoscope to her chest. As he listened to her heartbeat, he asked, Do you think I'll hear Barney in here? Oh no, the little girl replied. Jesus is in my heart. Barney is on my underpants. <laughs> Maybe not the steer I was looking for from the Holy Spirit, but it did make me think about the innocence of youth and whether or not we could all be here today and admit that Jesus is in our hearts. I have no concern whatsoever to what is on your underpants. Our Bible readings today at first glance seem to have very little connecting them. King David has, for reasons we are not party to, stayed at home when his men and his army went off to war. It's during this time that he sees Bathsheba bathing, and as we have heard, from this small indiscretion were tragic consequences. Great evil began in something small. In our reading from John, we heard that at the time when Passover was approaching, Jesus crossed the Sea of Galilee and was followed by a great many people who wanted to hear him. But it was nothing to feed them. He made a very small amount of food into enough food for over 5,000 people, with 12 baskets left over. Great goodness began in something very small. Let's consider King David for a moment. His army has been very successful in war and defeated his enemies. He's feeling triumphant and all-powerful, and he uses this to seduce Bathsheba. He knows that she's married, but is determined to use his power as king to get what he wants. There seems to be very little thought of the consequences of his actions, and later in the chapter, we learn that David then goes on to ensure that Bathsheba's husband is killed in battle, thus clearing the way for him to marry her. Verse 27 reads, After the time of mourning was over, David had her brought to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing David had done displeased the Lord. And we'll return to God's displeasure later. Sometimes in our lives we strive for the things we want with little or no regard for the consequences, telling ourselves we need these things, and even convincing ourselves that our lives will be so much better if we have them. But how many times have we got what we really, really wanted, only to have no sense of fulfilment whatsoever? And so we search for the next thing we need, and the cycle starts again. I'm reminded how often the three young boys, Elliot, Ollie and Noah, have pleaded with me in a shop how much they really, 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 really need that new football and how they will need nothing else ever. Twenty minutes later, if I'm lucky, they've discarded the football and really, really, really need something else. In our Gospel reading, we read how human need <coughs> and God's response to it look completely different from what we think we need and our own response to it. The past passage is set at Passover, when those listening on that hillside would be remembering their salvation from slavery in Egypt. As Moses fed God's people in the desert with manna for 40 years, so Jesus feeds the multitude with what seems like an impossible amount of food and there is enough for 12 baskets of leftovers, which can be interpreted as referring to God's provision for the 12 tribes of Israel. The small boy offers up his lunch, and thousands are fed. This small act of random kindness turned into something so good for so many. I don't know about you, but I often feel overwhelmed when I see the appeals on television for aid not only for countries devastated by flood, famine or natural disaster, but also the appeals for our own country, for the homeless, the abused or the refugees. How can the small amount I give to charity when I can possibly make even a tiny bit of difference? But then I'm reminded of how great goodness can begin with something small. On a recent visit to Cragside with a friend, there 
there is evidence everywhere of how something small can make a big difference. As we exited down the stone staircase, we were reminded by a member of staff to take care on the uneven steps. And as we went down, it was clear that over many years, the constant stepping of many people had worn down the stone to the extent that they were now very worn and uneven. Similarly, in Chambers Street in Glasgow, there is a small statue of a very famous dog, Grey Friars Bobby. The statue is bronze and almost black, but it has become tradition to rub the nose of the statue for luck as you pass. And as a result, the nose of the wee dog is now silver in colour. Another example of how something small can make a big difference. All of the actions undertaken to effect these big changes were very small, but the accumulated effect was great. So often we feel inadequate, that there is nothing that we can do to help, but our Gospel reading today tells us otherwise. When the small boy offered up all he had, no matter how insignificant it may have seemed, God turned it into something good. Great goodness began in something small. When we offer things to God, no matter how small they may seem, God gathers them, blesses them, and redistributes them for blessings beyond our imagining. During the COVID pandemic, there have been many examples of how very small things have made a big difference in the lives of others. Whether it was shopping for a neighbour, or delivering care packages to NHS staff on the front line, or just calling someone who is on their own. I'm reminded particularly of the 8pm clap for the NHS, and how when everyone came together and clapped or banged a saucepan lid, the accumulate effect was immense. And now we return to David and God. Even though David had displeased God, God still used him, despite all his inadequacies, to fulfil his purpose. God understood that David was human, and he knows our inadequacies and failings too. God knows we will always want more to satisfy our longings, but he still uses us to further his kingdom, to use those small moments of our lives when we offer to him to create great good. Sometimes even the smallest things we can offer can make a big difference in the life of someone else. We could offer half an hour of our time to visit someone we know is alone, or even buy an extra box of cereal to put in the food bank when we do our weekly shop. We could have a clear out of those things we really, really needed and donate them to the local charity shop. If we are more like that small girl at the start and have Jesus in our hearts, we might be more content to live with what we have and to share it, however small it may be, whatever the cost, to further God's kingdom on earth. Amen. We're going to turn again to your order of service and sing the hymn, Jesus Calls Us All Too Much.
loving Father, would you respond with the words, give us today our daily bread. So when I say loving Father, give us today our daily bread. Let us pray. Knowing that our loving God supplies all our needs, let us pray to him now on behalf of the church and the world. Father, we offer this time and the love of our hearts as we pray for the church, with all its varied ministries, for the youngest to the oldest baptised members, for those of mellow faith and those who struggle with doubt. Loving Father, give us today our daily bread. Father, we offer our commitment to pray the news each day and to share the pain we read about, longing for your peace and your justice in a world tense with aggression, weary from the ongoing pandemic and distorted with selfishness. Loving Father, give us today our daily bread. Father, we offer our homes and our relationships for you to work in and transform. We offer you our meetings and conflicts and all differences of opinion for you to use to your glory. Loving Father, Give us today our daily bread. Father, we offer you our solidarity with all who suffer or are heavily burdened. Hear us as we pray for their comfort and refreshment, wholeness and restoration, but above all for their consciousness of your presence in their pain and your love for them. Loving Father, give us today our daily bread. Father, we offer our thanks for lives well lived and faithful store of souls entering by the gate of physical death to eternal life with you. Prepare us all to meet you face to face. Loving Father, Give us today our daily bread. Father, we give you our lives, as well as our words of praise, so that each moment from now on becomes an offering of love. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ. Amen. And our closing hymn is Be Thou My Vision.
in comparison to the vast needs in our world. Nowhere near enough to save the thousands of dying of starvation around the world, or even to meet the needs of the hungry and homeless in our city. Yet we have brought what we can. As you once multiplied the five small loaves and two fish, multiply these gifts as well, so that once again the hungry may receive all they need and more. Amen. Go now to be nourished in the love of God, to be generous in the ways of Christ Jesus, and to be filled and fueled by the Holy Spirit. And may the blessing of all three, Creator, Saviour and Life Force, be with us all and those we love, today and always. Amen.